So thanks. All right, just hitting the button here. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our Friday class, um, an hour of some fun beating. And um, it, this is a recorded class. So there's going to be a replay available if um, there's any parts that I go too fast, no worries, because you can always catch the replay. And um, we're going, today we're going to be making some earrings. This could also be a pendant. So lots of options here, and I'm going to talk about um, the findings in a minute, but um, this is just kind of a really staple way to create a nice layered look. It has lots of versatility and can made, be made with lots of different beads. So um, if I get a chance at the end, I was going to talk about how to design these too. So lots of uh, great info for this hour. And I'm going to switch to my other camera so I can show you guys um, a better view of the project. And so here's the original. And this is the one that's in the PDF. It could be a pendant or it could be a pair of earrings. And um, this component can be a little hard to find. These are at Michael's. They're um, in the macrame section of the jewelry wall. So in my Michael's, it was on an end bar. And they are um, the ones that are called out in the handout. They're uh, creations from Bead Landing. So they'll look like that. If these are hard to find, I went ahead and tested it out on one I know is in, in big supply at most of the stores, and that's this one. And um, there's a couple versions. The version you're seeing here is this round one, also by Creations. And if you caught the class um, the Saturday before last with Sarah Ellis, this is the same one she was using for her class. So some of you guys might even already have this in your bead stash. Um, and then there's a version that I thought was really cool, look like that. This project would work on this one too. If you don't have any of those, or if you wanted to work on a flat component, I tested out a way we could do it on a flat component. And then I just wrote a quick supplement with these counts, um, which of course you can change up to your liking, but it was just, hey, this, this is one idea, one of many things that would work for a flat component to do a similar design. And then um, for, for, for those of you that are following us on our Facebook and our blog, we have another design that is of the same concept. It was done with some other smaller beads. So lots of potential here, lots of great things that you can do. And so I'm gonna go ahead and work through, I'm gonna work through this version and I'm gonna work it through with, um, with these really pretty blue colors because I feel like they, they seem easier to see unless you guys feel like this is better, but I. I thought this one stand out on the camera a little, a little bit better than our original colorway. So some of the other materials you'll, you'll need besides the findings are of course the seed beads and any colors will do. The ones that I used in, that I'm going, going to use in class today are this opaque light blue and the deep sea mix. And then of course these were the barley ivory and the amethyst transparent matte. Uh, we'll need some wildfire and some size 10 beading needles. This is the 0 0.006. So you could you could use the 0 0.8. It would work fine. Um, in the beginning, I'm going to use some chain of pliers to flatten my thread so I can get it through the needle a little easier. And then ear wires. So for ear wires, um, in the handout, it just says, hey, use whatever you like. Because some people are going to do pendants, pendant, some might do earrings. Here's some options that I've played with. These are fun, some jump rings. And then these are the ones that are on this sample here. They're a post and a post can be nice. Even though these are very lightweight, they are, um, you know, they're still, they're statements. So to balance out the look, it's nice to have something like a post like that. So this one comes in lots of different colors and um, the part number on that one is a, let's see, it's, it's 106-30956. And again, that's 106-30956. If you like this one, that's a, that's a good one to use. But there's lots like that. So um, on both the website and, and in the store. Okay, and then I forgot to show the scissors. So we'll need some scissors just to cut our thread and to trim it at the end. Okay, so I'm just diving in here. We'll need to cut about 50 inches of thread because there's lots of, you know, there's lots of loops around in this design. So it helps to have a good length of working thread for that. 
and flatten the end. This makes it easier to thread. So just flattening it with these pliers here. I'm grabbing a size 10 beading needle. And just fold that over at about you know, five, seven inches or so. And then you want to grab a component. And the first step on this is to brick stitch onto the hoop. And we, we've done this in um, a few of our classes before. And the only difference here is that this particular component is a little bit thicker and it doesn't slide as easier. Now, if you're, if you're using this round one, you'll be able to reposition your stitches after you've finished them to center them. On this one, it's a little bit trickier to do. You can do it, but you have to kind of push the threads along. I'll show you what I mean. There's a finish step one. I've been starting them just a hair under this edge here to get a good 17 count along this, um, along this edge. So about, you know, just maybe even like a little fingernails width down from the top and that kind of works. And if you had to move it, you could always just, just push it with your fingernail. And I think I saw, um, a pop up in the chat, but they're on step two, and I'll talk to that when we get to it. On step two, I typoed the count in the text. The uh, diagram's correct, but I, I um, have a typo there that I'm going to highlight to you guys. When we get there, I'll, I'll call that out. But so right now we're on we're on step one, and what I'm doing here is I'm just tying a double knot about a little a little edge a little bit down from the edge here. There's one part of my double knot. And the handout says to leave about a 10 inch tail. That, that's a plenty of length. I'm probably leaving a little less than that here, like seven or something. It'll work fine. Okay, let me get some size eight seed beads. This is that opaque light blue. It's a pretty color. And you'll wanna pick up two of those beads and slide them down. I'm just gonna push those out of the way here. And one of the things that um, if you're right-handed, it can help to have the component kind of oriented away from you. So I'm sitting over here and um, I have it pointed away from you. There's my tail, I'm getting the tail out of the way. Oops. Okay, and so I'm gonna bring this needle under it. So under the hoop here and through it. And then I'm just pushing down lightly on the top of the component while I pull my thread through. And what happens then is the beads will sit on the side and that's what you wanna see happen. And then come up through that second bead we added. So that's this one. And if it raises a little, don't worry about it. I am still pushing down on the component. And so it's just gonna sit right there. I'm not pulling super tight, but just a little bit and it stays in place. And uh, there's an optional step here I was going to show you guys that um, when I'm brick stitching just to save myself time later, I take the tail and just bring it up through the bead. If this is um, not easy to do at this step, don't do it. You can always just put a needle on this later and leave it in at the end. But if it's um, if it works out to do it here, just one less thing you have to do later makes it faster. So there's those two on there. And now all you have to do is brick stitch around for a total of 17 beads, one bead at a time. So I've got one bead here. And same thing, I'm gonna go under and through the hoop there. I'm gonna push down a little bit. And then just come up through that same bead. And it should sit right next to the first one or the second one there. Now I'll do a few more and um, feel free to ask questions about this, um, this step. Just coming underneath, over the top. And I am helping it a little bit. On, a, on another type of component, the threads will sit a lot easier on the wooden one that catches into the little grains and grooves. 
So occasionally I'm, I'm guiding that thread just to make it look neat. Picked up another bead. Even though the wooden frames, it adds a little complexity, it's so lightweight that you get all the effect of a statement earring without the weight of a statement earring. Which is why I went with the, the wooden, um, the wooden frame drew me for that reason. So I'm just same thing here, just going under. And so you would just want to keep going for a total of 17 beads. I'm going to switch over to my other one now, but here's fast forward. <laughs> so you get all the way to the other side, 17 beads total. And it looks like that. I'm going to move this one over. And so now we're getting to the part where I have a type of, I'm going to bring the, um, I'm going to bring the handout over and show you guys. Just got that needle threaded there. Apologies for, for this, but sometimes I just <laughs> I need to uh, read it three or four times. So you pick up two in the beginning uh, brick stitch and then you just add one bead after and I just added two more. So it should say 17 here and 19 here instead of 19 and 21. What we're going for with row two is a total of 19 beads this row. So I'm going to show you guys that. And this part, I'm going to stitch this whole thing because I want to show you guys how um, how to kind of feel your way through a brick stitch. Um, for the most part, it's going to be one for one. You're going to put two in the first bridge. So uh, and let me show you guys what a thread bridge is in case there's um, a new folks to brick stitch. Uh, brick stitch is done. The first row is always an, either ladder stitched or done onto a component like we've done here. And then the second row you, you, you actually stitch into the bridge that's over connecting each of the beads. And when you start a brick stitch row, the beginning of every row, you're always, always gonna be picking up two, going under and then coming up through the second. And so in this one, I want to do what's called an increase. I wanna make this have an extra bead on either side than the first row. So to do that, you're going into going to the first thread bridge not the second one. When you go in through the second, or the first thread bridge and then come up through the second bead. So that's the first bead I added. Here's the second one. And so that's what I was going for was one that's kind of sitting pretty much one for one on top of there by going through that first thread bridge. Now all of the subsequent ones should go through one for one, but when we get here, I'll show you, there's a spot where we're gonna put two stitches into one bridge. And so I just really quickly, I've got, a, got an eight on here and going under the next thread bridge. That's this one here. Okay. Oh, wow. My thread broke. Hmm. I think I can make it work. I'm just gonna have to be gentle with it. Okay, so there's one, sorry about that. I'm holding this one kind of precariously. So I'm going for a total of 19 here. Just picking up a bead, going out of the next thread bridge from the former one. And so, so far everything's looking pretty flat. It's staying, it's staying in plane. But when you start to see your, your uh, bead bow in that direction, that's when we'll have to put two into one segment. It only needs to be done one time. And it would still work if you didn't do it, but it's just a little nice to have that looks really pretty. So we're there. It's always kind of right in the middle, but 
You see how it's leaning up like that? I don't know if you guys can see how it's uh, bringing it closer. So all the ones before have been sitting pretty, pretty flat, but this one's bowing in that direction. So I know it's time to put two in, in the same thread bridge. So I've got one here. I'm going to let it bow a little bit. And I'm going to put another one in that same, that same one. And that flattens it out really nicely, makes it lay right next to the other one. And it's kind of curving. It's curving in a weird way because of the way this component has a little bit of a point here. So I'll just keep going. And now for the rest of the way, it should just be one for one, one bead into each thread bridge. And just put one for one. Everybody's quiet. You guys must already know all this stuff. And so we're going to a total of 19 beads. So our first row had 17 beads. And our second row should have 19. And apologies again for the typo in the handout. That was my bad. I get thrown off by writing the um, bracket repeat in the pattern because <laughs> it starts, you know, we start by adding two and then you do one, 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 one. And so I thought, oh, 19 times. Oh, plus the two in the beginning. So I added two more. I'm like, hang on. But I managed to get it right in the diagram, which I was very pleased to know I didn't have to go and fix that. It's a little more work. Oh, and so here I'm at the last bead and I need one more. See, I've got how many here? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. I've lost count. Mm, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, seventeen. So I'm good. I've got my seventeen. And sorry about over here. It looks a little messy. Um, I had one of these threads come off. It seemed to have. Um, sheared, so I'm actually holding a live stitch, but it's going to work just fine. All right, so the next part, and this is where it, it kind of, it's up to you what you like. This was just one of very, you know, a, a ton of different opportunities to come up with your own design here, but um, it's nice to see just one that's already been planned out, but how I make these when I'm, when I'm actually starting to make them is I create the rows without any pattern without any of the little details. And then I add my details later because I'll know where they'll, where they'll fit, right? So every time I've made these in the past, it's just been a solid color. And then I'll count them, how many, and decide, okay, at row, in this case, bead 17 needs to be another color if I want it to flow in that direction. So you've seen on, I'm sure you guys have seen on like other uh, designers' websites where they've got beautiful patterns made into these shapes. This is how they do it. First, they do it in a solid color. They get their counts and then they color it in or sketch it out. Or, you know, I, I think I even just drew little circles for my beads when I was, um, I have a little circle stencil and I just graft it out. But that's one way you can do it. Um, and then, of course, the counts for how I did it are here. So I'm just going to follow that for our class today. And then, of course, if you're working on if you're working on a flat component, we shared the counts for a version that looks like this in that, in that handout. But yeah, by all means, experiment and come up with something that, that you really like. Um, so there's five. The first one, I'm going to do 16 blue. And so there's 10. OK, and now I'm going to need to get another color. I'm using the, um, the deep sea color here. All right, so any color will do. You can choose anything you like. I think I'm just doing a little ripple pattern of a dark blue and then an aqua. 
And so each of the segments in between here need to be eight blue. So I'm picking up eight blue. Oops. There we go. And then another one of these repeats. Eight blue, another one of these. There's eight. So little cobalt colors are very pretty. I love it. And now that's my, you know, there's the first half and I'm starting the second half, but I'm gonna finish over here with what I did here. And that was 16 blue. So I'm gonna add those. One too many there. Okay, so this might be a little tricky with my broken thread, but I'm going to hold it. And we're doing really good on time, so I can always pick up that last one I had and make it work. But what you'll want to do is just go through that last bead in the second row. So it was the first one we added in row two. Um, come down through that and then turn and come up through the adjacent bead. So that would be the one right next to it. And something I noticed as I was stitching this, um, you'll see it when we get to this next row, when you're laying them out, like strand by strand, it's going to look like it's not going to fit. But for whatever reason, whenever I do the turn, which is the one we just did here. So for example, when you come up, go to the next one, when you do that pull down, it all cinches up and fits somehow. So it makes it frustrating if you're trying to design by laying the strands next to each other, because they're going to, they're going to tighten. And so now I'm, I'm moving on to the next part of the fan, which is it's 13 blue and then our pattern with seven after that. There's 11 and 13 and our blue pattern here. And then I think it was just seven blue and pattern. Seven more. Okay, and then finishing that with 13. Okay, three more and I've got it. Okay, I wanna show you guys what I mean about the layout. So it looks like, doesn't it look like it's gonna to be too big? It always looks like that to me. And then when I do the turn, it tightens up and fits. There's down through, through the second bead in, the, in that second row there and I'm gonna turn and come down through this one. And it just ends up working out. And so that's how you add those loops. And um, it takes a while, you know, you'll be adding loops for a bit. So here's one fast forward again, where I've added all the way up until the last row. And so on a round component, all of these rounds are going to get smaller. You'll find that different on a flat component on a flat component we're generally working with about the same number of beads at the top. But with this one, you, you come back down to one very quickly. It's kind of just part of the part of the look. I like I really liked the way this came out. But there's just so many other other things you can do. So so many patterns I'm going to come up through this needle here. This one might be a 12. I have these, um, these needles stuck in my mat from last class when we were doing the super duos. And so there's little 12s hiding in there. They're so tiny. I'm gonna pull this one off. 
Okay. All right. So fast forwarding through adding loops following, just following the same count that's written out here. And when you get to the very last one, it's a really easy, just three blue. And then one of our repeats, let's see what colors were. I was doing these colors here. And then just three more blue. And it just fills it in. And so that's that's one one possible design of many of many that you could do. And so I was going to just talk a little about weaving in because I get asked a lot about that. So now we've got all these little strands to deal with. There's this one which I I brought up through the brick stitched rows and just left here. And then there's my working thread. And in brick stitch, what I like to do to weave in is I'm going to come up through the next row. This is the one that is next to the one I went through. And I did that just to make it tight again. So it would stay tight. And I'm gonna go down through the next one. And now I'm gonna pick up a thread bridge. And so I can't see the thread bridge I wanna go under, but I know I wanna just go between those two beads there to get it, right? So I'll just go through the row below, just go through those two beads. Now I don't, I don't really need to see thread bridge to know that I've caught it if I do it that way. So I'm kind of close to the component there. I'm going to flip it over and just come up through that bead and it'll pull that it'll pull that thread right up to the top. I'm going to do that one more time and uh, get that to be pretty tightly woven in. Again just going right down next to the component. Push through. And come back up through the bead. And you could do that once more for good measure if you wanted to. Two is always, you know, two is enough. Three is even better, but there's, there's two. And then I just push down with my scissors and pull up with a thread. And that will help the thread kind of just hide in there. And just do the same thing with your tail here. And so I was going to just quickly talk about when, when I'm on this side, it can be really tempting to just, you know, just go through the strand to get rid of it. But I recommend against not doing that because eventually the thread's going to work its way to where it's sticking out from one of these beads here on the side and, and you'll see it. So it's worth it. It's worth the time, the extra effort just to weave it in the way we did before with the, um, you know, with the working thread. So that was just coming down through next bead and picking up that thread bridge underneath it. I'm just gonna do that one more time and then I'm done. So you're just sliding along that component there. Makes it really quick. Imagine if you're like, if you're making a lot of these and also it doesn't matter once you've gone to the thread bridge if you go to the next bead, it'll still be great. And then same thing as before, just push down, pull up. Hey Danielle, it's Carmi. Hey. I wanted to check in with you because I know you had um, the misfortune with the uh, breaking thread. <laughs> yeah. So I want to clarify for everybody um, your starting counts 17 and 19 because we yeah. were counting and on your second row you didn't do 19 so now we're confused I didn't you're right I didn't I counted 17 didn't I and they caught it <laughs> you're right I just did 17 again I didn't do 19 I was just worried about my broken thread <laughs> We well, assume that you didn't put the last two beads on because that was the side with the broken thread. Yeah, uh, well, it wasn't, but we can we can let that be my excuse. 
Oh goodness. Yeah, yeah, I know it's um it's wrong. And you can even see that it's wrong over here. But we're doing so great on time, and I still have this one that's not broken. So I'm just trying to figure out how the thread broke. That one I'm gonna have to figure out. I can see it here. Sadness. <laughs> but the good news actually, is everyone's a little relieved to see that you actually made a mistake. So <laughs> oh, it happens all the time. <laughs> Oh, I pull out so much work and I make so many changes and oh yeah, no, it's, it's the struggle. The struggle is real. Danielle, you, you are using a um, um, thread that um, I already reported on tonight. People were asking about Nymo thread and other threads. Generally speaking, when you select a thread for a project, I say it's because it's the one you think is best for the project. Would you yeah. recommend any of the other threads? Um, so if you want to use Nymo, maybe go down to a size 10 CC and try it on a component that doesn't limit you to fitting like this with the eights, or you'd have to increase your counts. But, but like, for example, on this one, if you did the tens, it would just be a little bit smaller and it would still work. But Nymo's, um, it, it, you know, so the, they tell you to use the, the biggest thread you can for the, the size bead you're using. Uh, Nymo is really thin, so you okay. get it'll just get kind of like a wall. I mean, it's going to work. It'll work fine, but it'll wobble more than this is wobbling. And the, the only other question I would ask you now is the silver component that you're just showing. Did you use the same counts as you did for the wood? Yes. Yeah. This is the same counts as um, as this one. If you put them side by side. You can show. Yeah. So here's why don't I lay them the right way. Um, here's the original next to those. And so those are the uh, the same ones that are in the handout. All those are the same. Thanks, Danielle. That's going to give everyone a few options if they can't find the wood. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And so I've got I've got this one going. This is the one we started um, working ahead. And since there's time, if you guys would like to see the counts done properly, <laughs> I can always just quickly whip through this. And happy to answer lots of questions um, while I'm doing that. It'll be a little bit like watching paint dry. <laughs> no, that's enjoyable for us. <laughs> <laughs> and I always get nervous. I'm like, is everyone asleep? <laughs> Danielle, is it your hope that people watch this class and then realize by doing some simple stitching, they could do this to any um, shape that they find? They just yeah. have to experiment. Yeah, exactly. That's what I, um, I mean, we're doing so great on time. I have so many components sitting in front of me. I could even just try to demo a little bit of that process. So I feel like that's you know, that's the real takeaway from, from these things is, um, you know, you can get a pattern and, and follow a pattern, but I know what everyone would really love to, you know, create their own little design and it's surprisingly super easy to do. Well, I think with this project tonight, people are understanding the first row. And if you would just go a little bit slower on the second row, cause that's, that's the most important new stitch. Yeah, and that's where I had my little mishap. So definitely, I'm glad. I'm glad we have the time to redo it. So almost there, and then I'm going to check my counts. You guys check too. Let me know if I got it wrong. I'm always surprised. It's nice and quiet in here, and I I make um I make more mistakes sitting in here than I do downstairs with my kids yelling. <laughs> I guess I need the noise. I don't know. <laughs> So let's see, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17. Yay. And okay. it's always an odd count, correct? Um, so this one just happened to be, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. Um, I ended up doing that because um, when I worked, when I worked this one originally, 
that was just the layout that I thought looked, what I was trying to do is make the bottom just a little bit bigger than the top for that, because I was trying to make it look like a bigger drop. But for example, if I just made it, these loops smaller than, it wouldn't matter um, if I had an even count or not. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, it's sky's the limit. You can you can make it any any count in any shape that you like. Okay, so I've got 17, 17 on this um, component. And now what I want to do is start my row two. And we're going for 19 beads. And I've got two on the needle now, or two on the on the strand. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go under the first thread bridge and then come up through the second bead. And so that's the first one there. I'm just going to come up through that. And then up through that second bead. And the thread did not break. Yay! I think maybe the wood was a little sharp on my last one. So check for that. And if it is, maybe just like a little nail file inside would help. And so now I'm just go through the next thread bridge. And all I'm doing here is picking up one seed bead. And then just going under the next one. And I'm going to keep doing that until I get that little bowing effect that where it's where it's tilting in this direction. And it's going to happen around here. And at that spot, we'll add two in one thread bridge. But for now, it's just one bead, next thread bridge. And another cool thing about row two and why I did a row two instead of just automatically going from this to my loops is this row tightens up these threads. So your chance to move these threads, for example, if you're on one of these components and you've done row one and you're not liking it, move it now before you've done your row two, because row two will make these really tight. Because what it's doing is it's pulling, it's pulling on that thread that connects this to the component. So with every one, I get a little tighter connection. And it also has a, a nice little effect of cleaning up those stitches and making them look a lot more solid. So still getting just one for one with one bead into the next thread bridge here. All right. And I want to make sure that's that's seeable. So it's really subtle, but it's starting to sway in that direction. I'm probably going to get one more into the next thread bridge, and then we're really going to see it. See it kind of, it's pointing this way. It's almost perpendicular to the work. And that's my sign that I need to put two in that, in that space. So I'm going to do that. Get one more in there. But definitely just, um, you know, especially if you're working with a different shape, you just feel it out as you're working. And you can pull these stitches out really easily and redo them if you don't like it. A lot of times if you're adding like interest, um, an interest bead, like if you're using different sizes and you get to a spot where and you get over here and it's just not, it's not meeting with the same counts, you can pull it back and purposely use different thread bridges in order to, um, make it symmetrical. So that's the cool thing about brick stitch is you can use that, that trick to make any shape work. So yeah, I'm just coming around. Daniel, do you think if you were doing this on a round shape that you would get a bowing effect? Does it, does it only happen because this has got a pointy edge? Um, I still, I still found a spot around here where I wanted to put two in the same thread bridge, but it was a lot less noticeable on the round shape than on this one, it's it's dramatic. On yep. this one, you really see it, but on this one, it wasn't as noticeable, but I still did it. And I think I mostly did that because I wanted these to line up. So somewhere around here, 
I put two beads into the same thread bridge, somewhere around there. And on the rest of them, they're all just one for one. But yeah, it's, um, and you can definitely get away with not doing it on one of these, but yeah, I definitely, it's this point that's causing it. But sometimes I've noticed that like I'll do one and then it looks great and I'll make a second one and the same steps didn't work on my second one and I can't figure out what's different about it. Well, maybe it's just a subtle difference in the way it was carved or a subtle difference in you know the casting or the shape of a, a component. So definitely just the skill of playing with it and trying it out, not being afraid to pull your stitches out if you have to, starting over if you have to. It all, it all comes out in the end, it all works. Um, but you'll definitely want to play with it, I think. And there's and this stitch is um, I'm I'm kind of drawn to using big bigger beads for um, both for zoom for visibility, but also for summer because the big beads are just more visible. But oh, and they're faster to to get something done. But the little beads can look very cool and very intricate. And so, for example, if I'd done size ten beads on or size elevens on a component of this size, I'd have a lot more rows to play with. And so a very intricate pattern becomes possible, you know, more pixels, right? So you, you can do a lot of stuff um, with the smaller beads that in the way of patterning. Let's check my counts. Let's see, we've got um, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so I need two more and that's perfect because I'm on my last thread bridge. Do you remember when we started, we added two into the one thread bridge at the very beginning? We're going to put two in this last one. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, in this case, it's working out that way, but. So we'll get two into that last one. And another little trick here. I think I didn't get to show that on the last on the last design, but I'm bringing the tail up through that second bead before I tighten it down. Save myself doing that later. There we go. And then the added bonus of I can use this to tighten by pulling them apart. So that one worked out a lot better than my first one. And the counts are right. And we're doing great on time. Does anyone want to see adding those rows on the outside again? Or um, what other ideas can I? Any other Danielle, I think um, the, the great thing is if you could definitely show the outer one. Okay. And um, do you have any tips for anyone? Like um, what if their beads aren't lining up in one of the rows? Like how do you make sure that it's oh. looking the way you want it to? Yeah, so if the trick of putting two in one bridge doesn't work, there is another trick you can do. Let me just pull these up really quick. Um, So if you had, for example, we'll go, let's go into the second thread bridge and show what that looks like. Here we go, and then come up through the second one. And now see what that, that bead's just sticking up there. And so what I just did there was a decrease because I, or, or I um, stayed the same, not, not an increase. I went through the second thread bridge instead of the first. And so it's causing that one to bow, but if I was stuck on that and I really wanted to keep it in that count, if I want 19 on this row, go down through that first bead again. And I know it's hard to see, but what I've done here is I'm catching that thread bridge that's under it, the first one, the first thread bridge going under that. And now come up through that second bead again. And it flattens it down. And it's also moved my, you know, my starting point down. So that's what it would look like if you if you went through the second third bridge instead of the first. So hope that that answered the question. Thanks, Danielle. I'm just gonna pull that out really quick. Now someone is doing it along with you, and that they said. Um, 
that their end beads on both rows are sticking up. They are. Yep. Well, that trick, that trick would still work. Let's go through the first one. Let's test that out. Yeah. So in my case, the they're just kind of they're going flat here. But if they weren't, I would do that same trick down through the first bead. And then go into the thread bridge that's under the, you know, those first two. And then come up through the second bead. And that should make it extra, extra flat. So I'm getting sunlight. <laughs> I think Danielle, a couple people would like you to run a hotline. Yeah, <laughs> I could do that. I hope they like the sound of a uh, screaming kids in the background. <laughs> <laughs> see which way did I go? I went that way. And sometimes I come from the back and sometimes I'm, it's always better to come from the back. I've read, I don't always do that. Okay. And so I'm just pulling out this last little stitch here. And get those off. Okay. And so does that pattern is just, you know, it's 16 in the, the first loop. 16 is the first section there. So there's, um, there's six, I just need 10 more. And I could, um, I could show also just, you know, alternate counts and play with that a little bit or stick to the plan. Let's see, there's two, three. I'm always tempted to try something new. You know, you make the same thing a lot of times and you're like, oh, well, what if I did this or that? And listen to that little voice that tells you to try it. This is one case where the little voice is right. Because you'll get, you'll get so many great ideas while you're working through these. And if you can't work them in that minute, write them down and come back to it. And so then I need eight of the blue. Daniel, when I look at when I looked at the project, I thought you were going to be doing peyote all the way down. How did you come up with it being loose like this? Or these loops? Um, well, I feel like I feel like it's kind of a common technique out there where there there's a lot of it's kind of an alternative to fringe. And on round components with fringe, you get um, you know you get kind of like a cool look where it's you can do lots of dimensioning but you have to use a lot more beads and a lot more thread. This was just kind of a neat way to do a fringe design with some dangle, with some sway to it. I don't know, just kind of an alternative way to do it. Gorgeous. Thanks. Kind of like a fan, I think. Um, and I know you guys have seen the ones that they do with, um, you know, like the long beads that kind of go along. This is another way to, you could add them here. Like I was showing earlier, you could add some interest beads on your last row. So like some drops, for example. Um, and on that flat component, I was using these drops, these bead landing drops from Michaels. So those are, those are on the strand wall. But yeah, you just want to play with that count and then see, um, See what looks good. If you don't like it, you know, just pull it out and try something different. And I'm gonna, and also this uses a lot of beads. I went through an entire tube of this blue, making those samples, the um, the ones over here. There's ten, and I need six more. So that first row takes a long time. So you're adding a lot of beads. And if you're like me, you're checking your counts like two times because you need to check the counts two times. And so coming in through the other side, that last bead on the other side there. And I'll just get as far as I can with our time so you guys can see it being built. So I'm turning and coming down through this um, 
bead that's next to the one on the end. So the second in. And when you pull tight, it tightens up a lot. And then I should need 13. All right. And then in between these, we need seven. Oh, and another tip I forgot to mention, it's it's kind of a pain because once you've once you've built it, you're over here and it's it's just easier to start building it from the side. But when I first designed one of these, I actually built my center first, just to kind of see what I wanted it to look like. Um, ended up changing it at the end anyway, but sometimes that's how that's how I start them. And I think it's because I was going for a center pattern. And so I wanted to see that that center one sat in the center and then I was just building it down from there. So more than one way you can do this, definitely try, try all of the ideas. Oops. Danielle, you're, you're getting a comment that um, we're impressed with how the beads always do what you tell them. And the rest of us are chasing them all around the on the mat. Eat mat. Well, I'm good until I have to count them. <laughs> and then it's like, hmm. And this is a good a good way to show on one that's um because this is a tight one. You can show how see it's not really fitting very well, but weirdly what happens when I turn and come through the next bead. As it tightens up and fits perfectly. No idea why. If anyone has the answer to that mystery, I'm, I am all ears. Danielle, have you ever used this, a size six bead? For this? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we did it with wire. Um, we have a really beautiful sample and Leo did some gorgeous photos of it. I wire wrapped to the same component with some sixes. I think a, a six would work stitched as well. I think it'd be totally fine. I didn't try it yet, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it would be really beautiful. And also this is a really thick component. So a six would sit very nicely on it. Thank you. So there's, let's see, there's five, I need 10. And we're looking at a few, just a few minutes left. I wanna make sure I have time to show you guys the, um, the upcoming stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we just keep going. Here's six in between each one. Danielle, we have a couple of new people tonight. So oh, yeah. would you find, just, just before you end, will you just show them again how you put on the earring finding? Oh yeah, let's do that now. So I, I feel like our, we're pretty good on this. This is just, um, you know, the same thing. We just keep going until you get to the center. And so I'll put an earring finding on each of the finished samples here. And um, I'll go ahead and use these posts because I, I have handy, but if you are using an ear wire, the process is gonna be the same. Um, on the wooden components, they come with a jump ring already attached. And so um, if you wanted it to be forward facing, you would either need to add another one to link here or just take this one off and link it to that. And I think what I did on this one is I added another one. So I'll go ahead and show that really quick and then I'll show this one because this does not have a jump ring. So it's just a little bit different. Um, for opening and closing jump rings, lots of different designers do um, different tool options for that. My preference is to use a bent nose and one of these square nose chain nose wires. They just hold the jump rings really nicely. And if you're looking for jump rings, there's um, there's lots of options at Michael's. They have these packs that look like this. They also have um, just the findings pack. 
I'll probably pull my jump ring out of there. This is handy. And so to open it, um, you'd want to hold hold your pliers to one side. And so the opening, I know it's hard to see, but the opening to my jump ring is right up here. And then chain those pliers, or sorry, the bent those pliers on the side. And then we're gonna do like a lateral motion to open it. And that preserves the round shape of the jump ring, but lets me open it. That's what I've got there. And then if you were gonna put this on like first, you know, chain or something, you wouldn't need necessarily to add a jump ring because it's already in the right position for that. You just slide it onto the chain or open it onto the chain. Same way we're doing this. So I just closed it laterally. And so now that's facing forward. And it will hang in the right way. And on this one, if I wanted to use that same earring post, the other one here, I'm just going to use the jump ring that's on it. So let's see here. And I was realizing as I was saying that, that I don't think these earrings actually have a front or a back. They're kind of the same on both sides. So I don't really need to sweat that at all. <laughs> but yeah, so there's another version. It's really cute. I really like that. I appreciate that, Danielle. So we're coming right towards the end now. We're there, yeah. Gosh, that goes so fast. I'm switching my camera back so I can say hi to you guys. The sun came out in Seattle. It was pouring rain this morning. Like you could hear it hitting the windows. <laughs> now it's like sunny, the weirdest weather. But um, yeah, so our next class is we're gonna do some really fun stuff. Um, gonna go on a kind of detour from stitching for just a, for just a couple classes, but. This one um, is a two part class and it is a design where we're going to do, I'm going to teach how to do the wire wrapping for a really pretty pendant. And then I have a version here with gemstones. You could also do this with size six and size eight seed beads. So we're going to make this little wire component and then put the beads on it. And then in class two, we're going to work on stringing it. And the stringing class is going to have three different ways you can use three different materials to create your own seed beaded chain to display your um, your wire wrapped work. And then the class after that is this one. And this looks like a necklace here and it is, but it's also a wrap bracelet. It can be either. It has a really cool um, like button closure on it. And that class, we're gonna focus on my nemesis, which is getting bracelet sizing right. and. <laughs> Well, there'll be some laughs in this class because I really struggle with this. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to do a class on it because if I have a hard time getting that right, I bet a lot of other people would appreciate talking about it. So we're going to use the design on it board. Um, but there's a couple other methods and tools that also do the trick here. So and I'll talk about those, but adjustable necklace slash wrap bracelet. So that's the class after that. And then after that, I'm going to be wanting to do some stitching. So. The crystal class. Um, this is a crystal herringbone stitch. It's made with um, four millimeter crystals and size eight seed beads. And then we'll we'll have learned to do these little wire wrap charms. So I threw one of those on there. It's something we'll learn to do in this class. So that's all the the next four the next four classes. So um, I had fun, <laughs> lots of laughs tonight. Thank you guys for being here, and I'm wishing you a really great weekend and happy Friday. Have a good night, everybody.